Church and welcome to worship this morning. It is the 14th of February and we're going to open services again next week, the 21st. Schools are going back this week, so many parents are breathing a sigh of relief, um, sending their kids off to school and just knowing they've got a morning or so to, to do some things that they need to do, get back to their work or the important things that they have in their lives. Um, I just want to say a quick thank you here to the school teachers, um, to our particular principal uh, Gary Skeels and all the principals in Stellenbosch who are doing such a great job of leading the schools. I um, also want to thank the volunteer parents. Um, the parents get involved in so many ways. Um, we're not volunteering for anything special this year, but um, I saw Roz Koch down at the school earlier today. She's involved in many, many ways. Um, just gives so much of her time to the community and to the school. Um, also, the parents who, who man things like the secondhand clothing store. Um, those who bring flowers for the teachers every week. Just the, the parents who are out there and really doing great things for our kids. So thank you to all of you doing those special little things that nobody notices. Of course, we remember our medical professionals and the workers, our frontline workers. Please keep them in your prayers. This whole um, vaccine debacle has left them all up in the air. So please keep them in your prayers. And also pray for the families, our families, who are now affected or infected by um, by the COVID virus. Now, it's one that is coming really close to home now, and we're told there's a third wave on the way, so please be careful. This can be very, very ugly. Now, uh, we're in the middle of a series called Time, Tithe and Talent, and the series is all about um, giving to the Lord. What we give, how do we devote things to the Lord? And today we're talking about tithe, about money. So I encourage you to open your heart and just relax. We'll try and have some fun with it. But also we're trying to look at the basic biblical principles of what it means to give and how and why we should. Now, as we come to worship, uh, won't you join, join me in a word of prayer? Holy Father, we thank you for the life that you've given us with Jesus. We thank you for his life, his birth through Mary, his life perfectly lived aspiration lived father we look at his life and we think we would so love to have that kind of commitment but father we know that we are unable to do that and that's exactly why he died on the cross in our place for our sin and thank you father for that sacrifice paid for us we pray that as we just think about it as we contemplate the cross this morning we'd be prepared to open our hearts and our minds and even our wallets for you to give you what is yours to begin with we pray, Father, that we would open our hearts in generosity for the people around us, praying that you'd, you'd bring to mind right now those people who need our prayers so desperately, the people who are working hard for, to keep our country healthy, our government who's having to make difficult decisions and negotiate tricky waters with lots of criticism, Father, our local government who has this tricky situation of having to deal with keeping services going and keeping the people um, looked after and cared for despite the fact that we have to socially distance. Father, we pray for all of those who will face poverty and loss of jobs during this time. And we pray for our own family. Father, keep our hearts open in generosity that we may keep feeding those in need. And so, Father, now we give you our worship. Now, May we open our hearts, may we hear from you, and may you speak to us in power through your Holy Spirit, through your scriptures. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Numbers 18 verse 21 to 31. The Lord said, I have given to the Levites every teeth that the people of Israel present to me. This is in payment for their service in taking care of the tent of my presence. The other Israelites must no longer approach the tent and in this way bring on themselves the penalty of death. From now on only, the Levites will take care of the tent and bear the full responsibility for it. This is a permanent rule that applies also to your descendants. The Levites shall have no permanent property in Israel because I have given to them as their possessions the teeth which the Israelites present to me as a special contribution. That is why I told them that they would have no permanent property in Israel. The Lord commanded Moses to say to the Levites, when you receive from the Israelites the teeth that the Lord gives you as your possessions, you must present a tenth of it as a special contribution to the Lord. This special contribution will be considered as the equivalent of the offering which the farmer makes of new corn and new wine. 
In this way, you also will present the special contribution that belongs to the Lord from all the tithes which you receive from the Israelites. You are to give this special contribution for the Lord to Aaron the priest. Give it from the best that you receive. When you have presented the best part, you may keep the rest just as the farmer keeps what is left off till he makes his offering. You and your families may eat the rest anywhere because it is your wages for your service in the tent. Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 to 24 Treasures of Heaven Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So we're in time, tithe and talent. And today we're dealing with tithe or money or how you should handle our money in terms of the church. Now it's a tricky thing when we come to talking about money because we, we own it. It is ours. We have the right to own possessions, the right to earn, and the right to decide what we will do with our money. But of course, the Bible has something to say about money. It tells us we ought to give one-tenth the tithe. The word tithe, in fact, means one-tenth. And uh, how are we in to, to interpret the biblical injunction to give one-tenth of our income? Now, there are all sorts of rules and laws about this. Should we give on our gross income or on our net income? Or what do we do about things like our bond? Or what if we use something to generate income, a part of our home perhaps? How do we deduct that in a sense from the tax of our tithe? Uh, there are many ways to work it out, but the bottom line, and I want to start with this, is that it is between you and the Lord. It is something that we seek out the Lord's face on and then we move forward on this. But let's see what the Bible has to say. We've read from Numbers chapter 18 and Matthew chapter 6 today to quite different texts, and yet really looking at the same thing, at our attitude towards money. The biblical word for the tithe in Numbers and in Deuteronomy is the word that the tithe is devoted to the Lord. The scriptures say every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's crook is devoted to the Lord. Not, not just is to be given, is to be donated, but is to be devoted. There's a particular word here. It is warfare language. It means to put to the ban, to utterly destroy as if it didn't exist. Now, when Joshua was conquering the Canaanites, there was a very strict law. Do not take booty. Do not take any of the possessions of the people who you conquer. And yet, of course, we have this famous story in, in the book of um, Josh, Joshua where this happened. And of course, they had to um, find out who had taken the booty because the Lord clearly was not happy. And uh, it didn't put it this way. It didn't go well for the man who'd done it. Now, this idea of putting to the ban means to make something as if it never existed, to burn it to the ground, to utterly destroy it. it it's more than don't touch. It means it doesn't exist. Um, William Wilberforce, a, a famous um, politician from the 1850s, he was responsible with a group of other um, politicians for having slavery abolished in the UK. And uh, he, at one stage in his life, wanted to wake up earlier. He needed to wake up in order to have devotions. He suffered from a particularly troublesome disease, and so he really struggled with his health. But he wanted to get up early to devote his time to the Lord, and so he decided he would punish himself if he didn't. He would take a gold sovereign worth several thousand rand in today's money and he would throw it into the River Thames. And 
but he thought maybe maybe I won't do that. So I'd rather donate it to a charity. So he decided he would donate this this gold sovereign to a charity, and and after a while he found it wasn't really helping him wake up earlier. If every time he didn't wake up, he gave the gold sovereign to a charity. Um, because he felt good about it. He was giving the money to a charity. So he decided he would go back to the original plan. He would simply throw the gold sovereign into the Thames River. A much more crushing idea because the money is gone. Well, that's the idea. When these Israelite soldiers came upon a wealthy town and they, they routed the town, they were not allowed to take any of the riches from the town. Just, just desperately wasteful in, in, in many people's eyes in the 21st century. We find this part of Old Testament idea of giving so difficult to give and give away as if it never existed. And we ask all sorts of questions when we do give. Um, is the money being well used? What percentage of it is going to be paying the salaries of the, the staff and the employees of the, of the organization? But when the, when the people of Israel were instructed in the book of, of Numbers to give every tenth animal, it was every tenth animal. It, it is quite strict. In fact, in Leviticus, it explains it um, like this. It says the entire tithe of the herd and flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod, will be holy or devoted, cherem is the Hebrew word, to the Lord. You cannot pick out the good from the bad, it says. As they walk under, they go. If one does make a substitution, both the animal, the animal that you substitute, that, that went under the rod and the substitute become devoted to the Lord as if they didn't exist to you. So there cannot be deception about this. It is not the best that you give. It is not the worst. It is every tenth one. Of course, we hear about the best a little later. So the idea is that every single tenth animal goes to the Lord. Why a tenth? Well, it begins with Melchizedek, this famous priest of Most High God and the King of Salem, who comes out to meet Abraham and brings a gift for him and uh, blesses him. And he brings a gift of bread and of wine. Uh, of course, we look forward to Jesus and we remember the, the communion of the bread and wine. But in return, Abraham pays homage by giving a tenth of his flocks and herds to Melchizedek, an appropriate gift. So what happens is he gives away to, to this person who appeared out of nowhere, as the book of Hebrews says, and just disappears into nowhere once again. He gives away because this is the principle. It is devoted. The tenth is to be given. Now tithe occurs in several other ancient Near Eastern cultures and cultures throughout the world. This idea that a percentage is to be given to the Lord, to the work of God. Now, of course, we this whole thing has an origin and secondly we read in Leviticus 27 and Deuteronomy chapter 14 that the tithe is to go to the Levites. Now the Levites were the 12th tribe of Israel. Now it's a little complex but even when the Levites were not given an inheritance when they came into the land, into the land of Canaan, they didn't receive any land as an inheritance. There were still 12 tribes because Joseph's tribe became Ephraim and Manasseh, the two half-tribes. But essentially what happened is because the Levites did not receive land or a portion of land, they simply lived in the towns and then served God in the temple. In Numbers 18 and 21, the inheritance of the Levites became the tithe. In other words, every family gave a tenth of all they earned and that tenth went to support the 13th tribe. Now, the principle of it is, is that 12, support, 12 tribes support the one tribe. The tenth of each tribe goes to support the one tribe. And interestingly, there's a tenth left over. Well, it's a bit more than a tenth in, if you do the maths. But there's a tenth left, left over. And that tenth is the tithe of the priests. You see, even the priests had to tithe. Of course, we will ask where this tenth comes from, why we ought to give a tenth, and, and uh, what it's all about. Well, in their day, the tenth that they gave was to support the temple worship, to support these, these priests that were continuing the temple worship, offering the sacrifices, receiving the offerings, and then devoting the offerings to God. Paul, of course, then in 1 Corinthians 10, has this little argument, well, it may have been big with the Corinthians, when he eventually says to them, the workman is worth his wages. In other words, the one who works for the Lord deserves a salary. 
He quotes the Old Testament saying, do not muzzle the ox while it threshes the corn. Now, muzzling the ox while it threshes the corn just means the ox, the, the ox cannot, um, cannot eat of the grain. Uh, and, but the, the point here really is that what, what Paul is saying is that if you are to be a part of this temple, if you are to be a part of the church, you ought to support the church. The twelve support the one. And now, I just want to put in a caveat there. I'm not batting for my salary here. We're, uh, Helena and I are really well looked after, and the Lord has been good to us throughout the years. I, I've never had to ask for a salary increase. Um, only once ever asked for a decrease in salary was several years ago, and there were, there were trying times for everyone. But the point I'm trying to make is that when the church takes tithing seriously, we don't shoot so close to the target. We, we don't end up having such a fine line between having a surplus and having a deficit. When 12 families support one full-time ministry person, we, we suddenly have a situation where there is a feast. In the book of, of Numbers, we find that the people of Israel are told to bring the tithe into the storehouse of God and open the floodgates that there will be a feast for the people of God. Now, let's just take it aside here. The book of Malachi has this interesting scripture. You'll have often heard it preached in the context of give freely and give to the Lord, and then he will open the floodgates of heaven to you and he will meet all your needs. In other words, if you give your tithe, God will make sure that you, you are wealthy. Well, uh, that is just a misappropriation of that scripture. It's, um, the scripture is one written to the priests. For in Numbers 18, God says the priests ought to bring the best of the tithe to the Lord's house and offer it. And the best of the tithe was actually given to the poor, to the poor to eat. In other words, the, the average person just took every tenth animal. It didn't choose the best or the worst. It was just kind of mean of what is good and what is not. But the priests were told to bring the best of what was brought to them to the Lord, the finest of every thing that was brought to them. And yet in Malachi, the prophet discovers this is not happening. The people, the priests were gathering for themselves the best and keeping it for their own families and then letting the, the dregs go off to the poor. And that's not what God intended. But basically what Paul is saying, well, if you have a church, he was speaking to the Corinthian church, you have a church, if you're not taking seriously your need to give in order to support the ministry, then there's something wrong with your understanding of giving because of the devotion. That first part of our salary, of our income, is already God's. It isn't, it's not just don't touch, you know, leave alone. It never existed for us, is the principle that the Bible gives us. If we have a full-time ministry, which the Israelites had in the, in the Levites, which our church has in our ministry team, which churches throughout the world have, if we have that, this is what this is for, is to support that, which is why we encourage people who are Christians to look at supporting the ministry of the church first and let the work of the church become not just, well, can we pay the salary of our minister? Can we pay our secretary salary and our, um, our caretaker salary? No, no. Can we have a feast with what is left over after everything's paid? And can we bring the best to the Lord and give it away to the poor? The, when we change our idea of giving, it's not just to meet a budget, but it is to create a feast from our house, which we've seen during COVID. Let me tell you the, the, the way in which our congregation has been generous. When we take seriously these things, we suddenly find things changing. So how do we apply it in, to the New Testament? Of course, the 10% rule was, if you really look into the Old Testament, it was more like 23% of their income. And count that every tenth animal was just not, not just the tenth animal born that year. It was every tenth animal from their flock. It's more like a capital gains tax or capital growth tax than um, simply an income tax. So having discovered that this, this tithe or this percentage that we give to God was never ours to begin with. It is devoted, utterly untouchable for us. It didn't exist. Secondly, we discover that God is calling us to support a ministry that is his, a model he has set up. And in honesty and faith, he's asking us to create with it, not just a way to pay a salary or to, to keep a building running, but a way to create a feast which the community can come to and enjoy. But the third thing is, is this grace upon grace to which Jesus calls us. Now, Jesus does not set aside the 
principle of the tithe in his teachings. He talks about the widow's might and he praises the widow for giving everything she has. He almost pushes us beyond the bounds of 10%. He talks about the Pharisees tithing their dill and cumin from, from their spice rack and yet having no heart for justice and, and, and integrity and, and, social, and righteousness. Um, uh, he's still saying the tithe is good, but the attitude of the heart has got to be right. He, he speaks from when the time when he sends Peter off to find the coin or drachma in the fish's mouth. And he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And to me, that's always confused me because it sounds like he's saying, just, just give your tax and your 10%. And I'm not sure how that works, but we can work it out between the Lord and us. How much do we give? What do we give? Well, there's a story about a 50 cent piece that was arguing with a, a 50 rand note one day. And the 50 cent piece said, said, you know, I'm all shiny. I'm heavy. I jingle in the pocket. And the 50 rand note said, yeah, but I'm, you know, I can, I'm worth more. And I've got all these ways in which you can see if I'm counterfeit. And so the 50 cent piece said, yes, but you know, I've got these, um, th these lovely ridges around the side. I'm this beautiful, beautiful, shiny, you know, bronzy color. And, um, and the kids love me to bits and the 50 rand coin said, yeah, yeah, but you know, of course I can, I can buy so much more than you can. I'm just worth more. I am better than you are. And the 50 cent piece looked at him and he said, yeah, that is true, but I go to church more often than you do. Well, how do we give? Now, the, the truth is our giving, the true purpose of our giving is what Jesus says in the, our Matthew text for today in Matthew 6. Storing up treasures in heaven is about our attitude because we don't see those treasures now and it's not about making an impact in the world it's about doing something which will create beauty in a life that we cannot even see right now it's about God's kingdom doing things for our kingdom it's not a straight transaction where we give this and we receive that back it's we're investing in something we cannot see right now but will have an eternal impact in life. The, the rabbis used to say that acts of righteousness, in other words, giving, caring for others financially, in these times, plant trees in the garden of eternity. And those trees will give shade and beauty to, the, to eternity. Now, Jesus seems to teach throughout his scriptures that the poverty into which the Catholic priests are ordained um, is the way for all of us. And I'm a bit scared of that. I grew up a Catholic and I'm, I'm a little glad that I'm a Presbyterian minister because I can own things. But the truth is, it does appear that Jesus, to some extent, is preaching that, this kind of poverty. Thankfully, I've, my dear friend Monty um, Maritz always reminds me that, that the Sermon on the Mount is aspirational. Jesus knows we can never achieve it. And that's the point. We need the cross. We need the Spirit. Um, it's aspirational in a Philippians 2.13 sense that God is at work in us to make us more like Christ daily. But Jesus says, store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. So how do we give? Paul has the scripture in 2 Corinthians 6 where he says, set aside every week a portion, a proportion of your income, a percentage of your income, and give it at the end of the week so gifts may go to the wider church. The word is proportion. It means a percentage, a fixed amount. And this is what you need to work out with the Lord. How much is he calling you to give? To give to the church and his work that we may have a feast in his place, in his temple, which is the church. You see, when God calls us to give, it's, it's not like the billionaires of the world. We see articles written by, you know, Fortune 500 magazine and so on about the billionaires giving so much to impact the world in terms of poverty and education and, and, and food. This giving is not to impact the world. It is not primarily to impact the world, but it must in the end, if it is to have an eternal impact. The point of this giving, the treasures in heaven, is that it impacts you. It changes you. It changes me. It changes our attitude, attitudes towards money. When we're able to give it away, we learn to appreciate what we do have. When we learn to be generous, and give to others, we learn that that is a way of loving others. We look towards others and away from ourselves. So our giving is not to impact the world. The lesson that William Wilberforce learned, we, will, we become so much more disciplined with what we do have when we learn to give it away as if it were never ours and to trust those into whose into his charge it is given. You see, it is given, first of all, as if it was never ours. Secondly, 
it's given to God's work in God's work in the church so that his work can be more than simply meeting a budget but being a feast for all to come and enjoy and thirdly it will change you for this treasure in heaven which you store up is a treasure in your heart because Jesus also says that heaven is within you the kingdom of God is within you and it changes the way we are towards others we learn to live holding lightly onto the things we have but being generous with others and being thankful full of gratitude for everything we have learn to give wrestle with the Lord about this how can you give so that we can create a feast in the temple of the Lord and how can you give so that God changes you in ways you never expected May God work in our hearts and change us in this regard. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word, for the way he works with us and works on us, the way he draws us, he strains at drawing us into new places with you. We pray that as we wrestle with this, it would not be a place of uh, discomfort, but a place in which we find the joy of being able to create this feast to which all are invited and which all will share in. May your church throughout the world, Father, become a place where the poor find food, where the needy find comfort, and where the, those who have suffered loss would find a listening ear and a shoulder to cry on. Father, we pray that United Church here in Stellenbosch would grow and grow to become a place that would be seen for its tables laden with good things because the feast has already begun. So Father, work in our hearts, change us, help us to treat thing, the things of this world as if they are not ours, but yours. For we give them to you, in Jesus' name, amen. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love forevermore, amen.